So I really don't like to not preach on the readings that we just proclaim, right? I usually like to preach on the readings and try to always not, not preach on the readings. It's, it's only for a really good reason would I ever not preach on the readings. But we're going to embark on these next couple of weeks and deviate from the readings um, because I, I think we need to. So three things this morning. Eucharistic revival, power of ritual, and some homework for us to do for next week. So first, Eucharistic revival. I know everyone knows what that means because everyone diligently reads what I write in the bulletin each week. <clears throat> but just in case you missed it, Eucharistic revival is... A movement that the church has decided now for three for three years started last year we're in about to start the second year where it's a movement to restore the understanding and devotion to the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist the church is kind of you could say in some ways it's like the alarms have begun to sound because studies have shown that about 70% of Catholics don't believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. And when you look at it at a further subset, the younger you get, that percentage of not believing of Catholics, not believing in the true presence of the Eucharist only increases. So 40, 40 years and younger, 80% of Catholics don't believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. And so the, the, the trajectory is going the wrong way. And it's not just to understand that, understand that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. It's also to believe it, to really believe it. And I think when you, when you look at deeper into the polls, you can some of it is that some people think that the church just teaches that the body or that the bread and wine are just symbols. But I think that's an easy one to just address. I mean, so hopefully we built some sort of trust over the last coming up on two years and like me standing here before you representing the church telling you the church teaches that the bread and wine really become the body blood of jesus you know i got ethan here in the first row we got first communion season upon us like we teach the, it, ethan if i if i asked him he'd say the Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus. If not, I talked to his pastor, Father, Father John Fan, right? But the same thing with the kids who will be here next weekend. Like, they know what the church teaches. The problem is the belief as we get older. I experienced a couple years in college. For me, college years when I had one foot in the church and one foot outside the church where, like, I, know, I knew what the church taught. I knew the church taught that it's Jesus true presence in the Eucharist, but I didn't believe it. I even would come, come up in communion line and I just didn't believe it. And the polls indicate that as well. The polls indicate, because you might just say, well, 70% of Catholics don't believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. That will just be those that don't come to mass. But the polls show that 50, it says 50% 50 of Catholics who attend weekly mass, 50%, say that they don't really believe that it's Jesus in the Eucharist, truly present in the Eucharist. And so that's like poll data, but I, even for me, for anecdotal evidence, I've been here now close to two years, and it fluctuates, but I'd say it's about every three weeks that somebody comes up to me after Mass carrying a host in their hand, oftentimes in pieces or crumbled up and say, Father Mark, I, I found this in the pew. I found this in, in the hymnal when I opened it. I found the host in the, in the rack. I found this host on the floor. There was one weekend a few months ago when three people came up to me one weekend and handed me a host or saying, Father Mark, here in this spot of the church, I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to bring it to your attention. And I would come up and I would pick up the fragments of the hosts and pieces we need a Eucharistic revival. This parish needs a Eucharistic revival. And you, and you may say, well, like, revival, like, why? What's the importance? Like, does it really mean anything? Does it really do anything? 
Revival, the word revival means to kind of be brought back to life, to be strengthened, to be, to be, to be, to have one's condition be improved. And see, the, the church teaches when one comes up and receives communion, if they really believe it, if they come up and they're thinking about it and they receive it with faith, that one then is transformed. One comes into communion with God. We call it Holy Communion. We become in communion with Christ when we receive the Eucharist. That's the point of the Christian life. The whole Christian life, the point of the Christian life is to be in communion with God. Another effect of receiving the Eucharist, of really believing it, is that it takes away sins. Because that's what Jesus does. He died on the cross to take away sins. And when we receive him the Eucharist, he takes away our venial sins are taken away because he died on the cross and we're receiving him. The church also teaches that when we receive the Eucharist and we come up and we really believe it and we're thinking of it, is that it strengthens us to, to, to not commit future sins. It, it, helps the, it helps us to overcome vice that we have in our lives. So if anybody's in this church that has things where it's like, man, I hate that I do this. And I, and I struggle at the way I treat maybe my spouse or my kids or my, my patients, whatever it might be, or this vice that I have, the, the Eucharist, because it's Jesus, strengthens us. But we have to believe it. And the interior disposition matters. And because we're human, and because it's a mystery, and it's a hard to believe, we need external signs to help our interior disposition. Which brings me to power of ritual. This time I invite you to pick up this card that hopefully you received on the way in or it might be in your pew. I've had a, the opportunity to visit Washington, D.C. I think three times now in my life. And, you know, there's so many great monuments and memorials to, to visit in Washington, D.C. But by far, hands down, my favorite place to visit in Washington, D.C. Is, is Arlington National Cemetery. And as soon as I go there, I make a beeline to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which you see here on the top or on the top of, of this card. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, you may know, has the unknown remains, unidentified remains of a soldier in World War I. That's the big tomb there. But then the smaller ones in front is on the front left there is a World War II unknown soldier. The middle is the Korean War. On the far right is someone from Vietnam who was later identified, so his remains were extracted, and now it's just left empty to signify all the service, service <coughs> men and women who, who have lost their lives, who, whose bodies have never been found. And the tomb of the unknown soldier is guarded 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, no matter the weather, as you see in the middle photo there, it's, a, it's, a, it's cold, there's snow, there was a hurricane. I think it was Katrina that went through a couple of years ago that went up to D.C. The guards, the sentinels, they never miss a, a, a moment of guarding the tomb. And if you go there and you watch, especially the ceremony of the um, changing of the guards, the guards, every movement they make, from the way they walk 21 steps to the north and then they pause and turn and pause for 21 seconds and then they turn the other way, walk 21 steps in perfectly sync with the other soldiers who are, who are about to take their post. From the uniform they wear, which is impeccable and iron and the way they cup their hands, when people watch it and they see that there's so much intentionality from the way they turn to the way they walk, when they watch it, it's powerful, and you're silent. There are signs that say, please keep silent, and please remain standing during the changing of the guards, but you don't even need those signs. Because when you watch it, and oftentimes there's bleachers with kids there, it doesn't matter how old they are, if they're 80 years old, or they're three years old, they're watching it in amazement and awe and wonder. Because what it is, it signifies that something, it signifies something important. That something's happening here. Do they, do they have to do this? Do they have to do all of those things with the 21 steps and the 21 seconds and the 100% cotton wood glo or um, cotton gloves and the 100% wool pants, even in the 100 degree heat? No. What they could do 
is one soldier could come up and say, hey, dude, your, your time's up. Let me hand the rifle to me. It's my turn after the 30 minutes. That could be done. Same thing with graduation. We're on graduation season right now. The eighth graders here could drive up. Their parents could drive them up in the car. And Mrs. Paul and I, the principal, could just throw the diploma through the window. And they could be off their way. But that's silly. It demands more. The very nature of the thing demands sacredness. So they will process in and cap and gown. And there will be a ceremony. There will be a ritual. Those soldiers guard the sacrifice of the men and women who gave their lives so that we could have the freedom in this country. We surround important things with ritual. It's what we do as humans. Why? Because we need the help with the interior disposition. When we see it, it communicates so much more. The mass, the sacrifice of the mass of the one who went to the cross to die for our sins, who has made present the sacrifice, the one and only sacrifice, not another sacrifice, but the same sacrifice that took place 2,000 years ago is made present on this altar. And it is surrounded with ritual to help our eyes to see things of the interior disposition. So our homework for next week, I'm asking that everyone take this card on the back of it. There's a QR code. I'm asking that you, this will take you to the, the changing of the guard. It's a nine minute ceremony to watch it. Because when we come back next week, the homily next week is we're going to show external signs at mass that help our interior disposition to help us to realize and to remember and to recall and to believe of the true presence of the Eucharist. For example, last week, somebody after mass asked me, he said, Father Mark, I noticed at some parts during the mass, you hold your fingers together like this. Why? I said, that's a good question. I said, I said you see, because after I touch the consecrated host, before I touch the consecrated host, I'll touch my microphone or anything, it doesn't matter. But after the host is consecrated and I touch the consecrated host, especially after the fraction rite, when oftentimes there's little particles from the host on my fingers, I will keep my fingers together so that anything else that I touch, like my microphone, when I turn it on and off, I won't do it with these two fingers. When I turn the page in the missile, these fingers will be together and I won't have this touch that anything else until I rub my hands on a purificator or the server comes up to purify my fingers. That helps me. That helps me believe and help understand and to remember when I receive and I'm, and I'm celebrating mass up here. There are so many external signs in the mass that are ritual, that are part of the ritual to help our interior disposition. We need a Eucharistic revival like we do individually, our church does, but it's not just meant for us in the church. The bishops are talking about the Eucharistic revival, talking about our world is in need of hope. Our, our world is in need of strength. And we are so much caught, cut off from the very source of strength, which is Jesus himself, who is present in the Eucharist. So as we turn to this mass, do your homework for tomorrow, watch this ritual, of the changing of the guards of the tomb of the unknown soldier. And we'll come back next week. And as we even turn to this mass now to help our hearts enter into the interior disposition so that we may truly believe in what it, who it is that we're about to receive in the Eucharist.